Hello, welcome to part two. So for the next part, uh, so part one is all about setting the J-frame and starting to think about object-oriented pr programming in terms of the objects that you want drawn on the screen. Uh, the other thing that we want to do is we want to be able to kind of control maybe some of the objects with the keyboard, right? And um, that's the other behavior that we can uh, implement, right? So right now, the main panel implements an action listener, which means that we're implementing what it what it needs to do in terms of um, the timer now we also want to do uh, a key listener key listener um and so the key listener methods are going to be so again remember when you implement a class right when you implement um i guess it's really an interface but we didn't talk about interface because it's no longer an exam Again, you're promising that your class, whatever you're creating, in our case, the main panel, we're promising that it has the behavior of a key listener. Here, we are promising that it has the behavior of an action listener. In order for a so-called class to have a behavior of another entity, um, what we really have is a set of methods. And so that's why the number one correction Whenever you implement an interface and you haven't actually done the work, that's why the quick fix in Eclipse is to add the unimplemented methods. These sets of methods that are auto add in by you know using that autocorrect part, uh, this right here is the set of behavior that we're promising a main panel um, exhibits, right? So we're saying a main panel knows how to handle key pressing, key release, and key type. Um, but so far, what we haven't done yet is uh, we now need to connect the main panel's key listening function to the actual frame. And so that's where we, we go back to the constructor, right? So remember, the constructor creates a J frame. The J frame is what we see ultimately. Um, and then what we want to do is we want to connect our behavior of listening to keys to that frame. So we're going to do f dot add key listener and then this. So now that we've done that, uh, anytime we are using the J frame, right? When the J frame is in full view and that's what we're using, we should be able to trigger these events right here. So these events will be automatically triggered based on your keyboard commands. So a key press, for example, is when you press it down, right? A key release is immediately after you release it. And then the key type involves a press and a release. So I'm just going to put it under a uh, key press, for example. And then we're going to go inside key press. So now when I click play, um, so I'm right here, right? So again, we have code that says, Okay, when, when there's a key press, you need to trigger that method called key press. And then that method says to to the console to print out key press. So I'm going to press the space bar now. And as you can see, right, it triggers the console to print key press. So in theory, okay, now what if this is connected to something else? Or, you know, what are what are the keyboard keys? What are we listening for? So that's kind of where it becomes important. Um, so the the keyboard key that you press is going to be wrapped up in this key event. So let's see what kind of stuff we can print for this keyboard event. So arc zero dot get key code, for example. So what happens if we just print out the key code every single time we press a key, right? So that actually allows us to figure out what the ASCII character is of every single key that we press. So for example, right now I'm about to press the W key. Oops, uh, I need this W. So W is 87 and A is 65, etc. right? So if you ever wonder, you know, what is the ASCII code for every single one of these keys? Well, if you have a keyboard listener set up, you can actually figure out what that's encoded to, right? Um, or, or what it should be so now you can imagine right remember last time we have this ball class 
and in the ball class, it's moving uh, its X, it's updating the X every time it paints itself. Now, what if we have a helper method with the ball that says, hey, move, move to the right. And we only want to do it with when we press the D key. Well, we could add a helper method called move right. And then now, the only time we want X to be updated should be when we call the move right method. So now that I have this, I can now connect the ball's movement to the right with a keyboard command. So what if we always do it every time we have a key press? So now here, what we can do is we can just say, OK, remember, this, this method is triggered any time we have a key press. So now if we do a ball that move right, every single time this is triggered, we should be able to control the actual movement. All right, so I'm smashing my uh, space bar right now, and that's how I'm moving it. You can, uh, you know, similar to what we've done in class, you can have it turn on a velocity. So let's say, okay, what if we have additional things like um, velocity in the X and velocity in the Y, velocity values. And what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, what if um, when I press right, I just turn on my velocity so it's positive. So I can say, Move right, so here we're going to do Vx is equal to 5 or 1. So now what we can do is within the paint method, um, we can just say, well, whatever the value is of the velocity, remember the velocity is now being set by these helper methods, we can just say that we are going to update the x according to that velocity, right? Update the position based on velocity. Okay, great. So now we also need a way to stop it. So public void stop. We can say that Vx is equal to zero. Um, so you can kind of expand on this. And now, oh, what if I want to control some sort of up and down? Well, what additional variables might you need? Uh, what additional helper methods might you need, right? So there's also clever ways to do things. But um, again, I'm encouraging you to kind of start creating your helper methods start thinking in terms of instance variables, whatever you need to, to kind of practice um, that type of programming. So now here, when I have a key press, I'm actually going to turn on the move right. But right, what I want to do is, well, let's pretend that we're using the arrow keys. If we're using the arrow keys, you know, if, if I'm pressing the right key, maybe when I release that key, it should stop moving. So on key release, I'm going to do be that stop. Right. So right now we're not tied to a particular keyboard key. It's anytime there's a keyboard press, and then this is anytime there's a key release. So I'm just going to use the space bar right now. So when I press the space bar and hold it, right, I haven't released that key, but now I'm going to release it, and as you can see, it stops the ball again. That's because in the ball class we know that the paint method is always trying to update the x position based on velocity in the x direction. However, that velocity in the x direction is sometimes 1 uh, and then sometimes 0. Right? Uh, these are the cases where it's sometimes 1 and sometimes 0. So when we call the move right method, it turns it to 1. And then when we call the stop method, it turns it to 0. OK, so now what if you're wanting to use WASD well, that's where you can use your switch statements or your if statements. Um, so here, uh, I'm going to go back to kind of printing the values of the key press or the key commands. Uh, so system that out r zero that get key code. So I just want to you know remind myself what the D is in ASCII. So 68 is a value for d. So now I can do something like if arg0.getKeyCode equals equals 68, then that's the only time I'm moving to the right. Um, so let's do this now. 
So I'm going to press a whole bunch of keys right now. I'm pressing them. Nothing's happening. You can see it in the console right here uh, that I'm pressing some key commands. But now I'm going to press the D key. And as you can see, that's the only time it ever moves to the right. So you can expand on that. And now you can. Um, sorry, <laughs> my dog is being weird. Uh, and so now you can kind of add additional functionalities. Uh, in terms of switch case statements, let's see how that works in switch case statements. Switch. So you're going to make a decision based on some sort of value which is the key code. And then you're going to look for certain cases. So case 68. So essentially, this is uh, if key code is D key. So now we can do the same thing, B that move right. Uh, but what you want to do is for case statements, you want to make sure that you call break after you've done everything that you need to for that case, right? Um, so now I want to do the left as well. I just want to know the left one is 65. So I want to do case 65 and stuff like, for now, I'm, I'm going to put dummy code, uh, stop or left key using a, and then I'm going to make sure that I call break. Cool. Uh, so now when I press D, it's going to move to the right. But then when I press A, um, it's going to do nothing because I don't have any code connected to it. Cool. And uh, essentially, that's that's what we have. Um, so that's how you would incorporate keyboard key commands to your program. Thanks.